Man, you know, a troubling, troubling quote years ago. If you continue to view poverty and suffering from a distance, it will become tolerable. I don't want it to be tolerable. I want it to affect me. I want it to trouble me. I want it to call my Christian faith out. I want it to, I want it to convict me. I want to hear the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I want to hear the word of God say, go, go, go. And I, and I can tell you, this is going to sound really strange, but it's weird. The places that, that I'm going, it's not even like I'm making a conscious decision to go. It's like I'm being pulled. It's just a weird thing. I, uh, two weeks, three weeks, I leave for Pakistan, you know. That's not a place you just sign up and say, hey, I think it would be a cool thing to go to Pakistan. No, it's like, you know, 1.6% Christians, they're persecuted. They have the worst jobs ever. You know, there's, there's you know, uh, yeah, bad stuff that goes on. It's not a place you sign up for, but there's a pull. There's a pull of going there. And it's kind of interesting because you know, the guy that's there tells me, he says, uh, you need to wear a beard. Grow a beard before you get here. You'll blend in. <laughs> and that makes sense, right? A white guy with a white beard. Sure, yeah. That blends in much better than a white guy without a white beard. So this morning, he says, call, call. I have something to discuss. Bob, I was talking about this kind of beard. <laughs> Apparently, mine isn't good enough right now. It's a little, yeah. May God use you abundantly this morning. Amen. And then he sends me a bunch of other pictures with beards. So you got to pray because it's a little fuzzy there. <laughs> you know, it's. It's, I'm, work, I'm trying, you know what I mean? I'm trying. Oh, all right, we're talking about removing the mask. You know what we all have in common here? To some degree, every person in here deals with some shame. And every person in here, at one time or another, wears a mask. And every culture in history has masks. And they wear them for protection, for intimidation, for entertainment but always to protect the vulnerability of who they really are. Ah, in some ways, a beard is a disguise, in theory anyways. So we all wear masks. We all have shame. We all, because of the fail in the garden, create our own ways to deal with this shame. I can tell you that Jesus has been all along trying to get you and I to let him deal with our shame and not ourselves. I have found that he does a much better job of dealing with my shame than my weird little way of trying to do something to cover it up and hide. So we're going to talk about hiding. We're going to talk about shame. We're going to talk about concealing. This is a, a two-part series. I'll finish this off in a couple of weeks. But we'll talk about removing the mask. How many of you are aware that you wear masks sometimes? That who you present yourself isn't? Okay, good. Honest. You're the honest service, unlike the first service. Um, no, kudos to you. It's interesting. We all have just creative ways to do it. Women have uh, makeup called concealer. I just found this out. I know nothing about makeup. I just know there's a whole bunch of stuff in a bag that I don't touch. It's protective property, but it's, it's, it's makeup, and there's stuff in there called concealer. So I looked it up, and women use concealer to hide dark spots around the eyes and to mask over blemishes. And do you know how much women spend on this in their lifetime? The average woman will spend $200,000 on, yes, makeup <laughs> and concealer and blush and rouge and mascara and eyeliner. And that's all I got because I don't know anything else after that. $200,000. In a lifetime. So I looked at my wife the other day and I said, you're wearing our retirement. <laughs> and that didn't go over big at all. Not at all. But that's a lot of money. I mean, it was when I was a kid, $200,000. But it's to conceal. And that's kind of what women use. Men use stuff also. They use something called pretense. Yeah, men use this image thing. Men show their best stuff out front. They use positions, titles they have, achievements they have, good things that they've done, who they know, name drop. 
perceptions, how people view us. They'll use all those things to create a persona. That's the word. Persona that we wear. And it's much harder for a man to let someone look on the inside of who he is than a woman. And we're going to unpack that a little bit. And we're going to see. I want you to see what the original state was before sin entered in and the place that Jesus has been trying to recapture all along in our life. So Genesis chapter 2, and we'll start with verse 21. Pastor Ryan did a phenomenal job last week of touching on this and talking about that. And if you missed it, you need to go online and look at it. It says, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And so you know, you know what you see here right off the bat is that God finds it necessary to open a man up physically to create a relationship for him. You know what women really want from their husbands? It's not so much stuff. It's those dreaded words. Would you just open up? In fact, I would say, if you guys really want to be a hero on Valentine's Day, um, don't be the guy. In fact, if you want a good laugh, go to a store on Valentine's Day and watch men in there desperately trying to find a meaningful card in a picked-over shelf. No, I'm serious. You will see guys, oh, I, I thought there'd be some left. Yeah, last minute Valentine's Day. Good move. Yeah. I would go, in fact, I would go today and buy them. I'd buy them all, and then I'd hawk them outside. <laughs> I would. You would make money. There's a free little thing, tip for you right there. I, I will tell you, v Valentine's Day, if you look your wife in the eye and just say, here's what I got you for Valentine's Day. I just want to open up and share my feelings with you. <laughs> my hopes and dreams with you. My fears and failures and my insecurities. I would like to open up to you and just let it all out. I guarantee you don't have to buy her nothing, man. Now, you'll probably die in the process. Because you'll get your little spiel out and then she'll say, well... Tell me more. It's like, that's all I got. No, we can't keep going there. It's terrifying. So God opens up Adam to create a relationship. It's, that's a consistent. To have a relationship, even friendship, a close relationship, husband and wife, lovers, you have to open yourselves up. There's a reason we don't. The man said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She should be called woman, or literally, woe, man. <laughs> Kind of true. For she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they became one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. Say naked. naked. We're in church. Naked. <laughs> not ashamed. Not ashamed. Naked, not ashamed. It's there, man. They were created with union and transparency and connectedness. And there was nothing in between them because sin had, hadn't entered in. And there was just this transparency and, and everything was real and authentic and, and harmonic and everything was just right. And think about this. There was no anxiety. There was no dejection. There was no guilt. There was no condemnation. There was no shame. There was no pretense. You don't have, you don't have Adam going... Hey, babe, check that out. He didn't have to. And she wasn't saying, does this make me look fat? Does, do I look like, nobody's saying any of that. You know why? Because God is a perfect creator. And he's only creating perfection. And there's nothing to be improved upon with a perfect creation. That's a great state, man. Two naked people running around a big garden. That's a good life right there. You kidding me, man. Wow. That's awesome. That's just awesome. Tag, you're it. Freedom. Total freedom. No bondage. No hang-ups. 
No trying to pretend you're better than you really are. There's no reason to. It's just God the creator and this whoa man, woman. And I love the Hebrew language when it talks about how, how Adam was created. It was kinda, he was kind of crudely created out of dirt. And then the words that are used to talk about his wife was finely crafted. Isn't that true? Guys just look like guys. <laughs> and women, man. Women. God created women. Beautiful. There's not, you know, you know what's only here? The only thing that's here so far is congruence. Everybody say the word congruence. It's a great word. I want you to really meditate on this word. Define this word. Look, go, go deep with this word, congruence, because I think it really is a key to healing shame. We won't get there today, but this congruence is, is the idea that there is no gap between who you present yourself to be and who you are. Incongruence is there's a big gap, and there's things I don't want you to see about me, and there's things you don't want me to see about you. And so we create things in this gap. And I would say the whole reason, the whole scripture narrative from Genesis to Revelation is all about Jesus reconciling that gap from what was lost to what should be. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He's the only one that could do this. So this is a picture. You know you're tapping in to your identity in Christ, wholeness in Christ, when you realize there's nothing to prove. You don't have anything to prove to anybody. You don't have anything to prove to God. You don't have, there's no reason for you to try to impress anybody. You're certainly not going to impress God. Your works, my works, are seriously going to impress God? Let me tell you how much I prayed today. Really? Jesus is praying 24-7. There's no, there's no need to impress. And anytime you and I are trying to, we get sucked into it. Everybody gets sucked into it. That need to try to impress, to be larger than life, to be bigger than we really are, to be admired, to be approved. Anytime you're, you, you find yourself walking in that, you've kind of lost touch with how God originally intended you to be. The only reason you and I do that is because of shame. We'll define it later on, but the congruence, man, I want you to think about that. Jesus, the man Jesus, was totally congruent. Totally, 100% congruent, 100% of the time. In fact, you know the verse where he says, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. You know that word truth there? This is a great word means there's no opacity in Jesus. You know, opaque. You know what opaque is? The muted glass that you can't really see, usually in bathrooms, showers. When Jesus said, I'm the truth, he was saying, there's, there's nothing opaque about me. Literally, what you see is what you get all the time. I'm not playing any little games here. I'm not hiding. I don't have a reason to hide. I'm not pulling a bait and switch on you. What you see is what you get. And that's why when Philip said, show us the Father. Jesus said, Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. <sighs> Big, man. Congruence. That's a good way to pray in the next couple of weeks. Lord, Jesus, help me be congruent. True to who you are. True to who the Word says I am. True to myself. Congruence. Genesis 3, we've got a problem. Ryan elaborated on it last week, so I won't belabor the point. But it says the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord had made. Now, some people say, well, was it a snake? Was it a serpent? Da, da, da. You know what? It was, a cre it was a creature in rebellion against God, bent on taking other people with him. We can fight over the nuance and what it is and you know, what was it really and all that. But you know what? This serpent was bent on deception. This serpent still speaks today. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat of any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from these trees in the garden, but God did not say 
God did say you must not eat the fruit of the tree that's in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. Let me just tell you something. God created boundaries and restraints to his creation to really say he was God. And don't forget you're not. So there's boundaries. Let me tell you something. Boundaries are good. Boundaries are for life. They give life. They protect you. Don't ever look at the word and say, that's restrictive. If it's restrictive, it's for your life. And there's a, you know, there's a, a brand or philosophy of Christianity that really kind of goes like this. Well, I'm saved once and for all, and there's grace for everything, and I can really kind of live any way I want, and it doesn't matter. That's a, that's a garbage philosophy. That's garbage theology. It does. It matters, man. Think about it. I'm glad there's guardrails on the road. I'm glad there's white lines. I even stay within them sometimes. I appreciate them. I appreciate speed limit signs. I do. I haven't had a ticket. Oh, gosh. In 30 years. I know. At one point, I had 10 and my license taken away. I rode the Metro bus for two months because I was disobedient. <laughs> I thought it was funny. I didn't know Jesus. I thought rules were a joke. Yeah, so when I was handcuffed, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> went to jail. It was no bueno, man. <laughs> I'm telling you, I sat in this little cell. It was horrible. Yeah, the, the, the officer really didn't care. I mean, there was just this little, ah, there's a warrant out for Hasty. Bring him in. <laughs> I just went, what? And I had this Christian girl I was trying to date telling her that I had reformed my life. <laughs> and she was a goody girl, you know, one of them goody girls, kind of raised good and right and all that kind of stuff. And so I'm going to jail, and she's going, what is going on? Because I broke the law, and I should have. And when I went to give an account to the whatever, magistrate or something like that, and I said, I'm a, uh, he said, what do you have to say to me? I said this. I'm a victim of the circumstances. I said that. I said that. I don't think he ever heard that. He laughed his head off. He goes, well, yeah, here's how much you owe. And then I became an example for my uh, auto insurance guy. Showed my file to everybody. Don't drive like this. He's <laughs> glad to help. <laughs> it's true, he did. Well, I walked by one time, and there's my file. What's my file? He goes, I'm using you as an example. Said, he goes, yeah, to kind of scare people. Glad to help. <laughs> Boundaries, good. You know, here's the, you know the problem? The woman said to the serpent, here's the problem. You're talking to a serpent. You are talking to a serpent. You've already lost the battle. When the serpent talked and you listened and you talked back, you entertained. When you entertained it, you've already lost. The battle's over. It's game over. You know what? She disobeyed a fundamental thing that God said. God said, take dominion. He didn't say, talk to the animals. He didn't say, converse with a serpent or a snake. He said, take dominion. You know what she should have said? She should have said, get out of here now. Adam. She didn't. She's talking. Game over. She lost. Oops. Gave it to her husband. Oops. Over. You know what he said? he said? He said, this was the seduction. This was the temptation. You're going to be like God. They were already like God. You were created in his image. The first creation created in his image. They already were like God. They already reflected the character and the nature of God. They already represented the rule and reign of God. I will tell you, in every temptation that you have, I don't care what category it's in, 
there's a, a seed lie that says God is holding out on you. That you need to do something to get what God has held out for you. That's, that goes on everywhere. You need to do something more. What, what could you get that you didn't already have? And this was a fatal mistake that we are all born into now. Probably going to have words with Adam when I get there. You're not going to die. Man, God knows your eyes will be open. You will be like God. She ate it, gave it to her husband. Gone. Verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. Isn't that interesting? They realized they were naked. They had been naked and not ashamed. Now they realized their nakedness. So they sewed leaves, fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves, which is kind of comical. I mean, come on, really? You're going to grab fig leaves, tie them together, do something. You're, that really is what you're going to do? Why was it so vulnerable? And why was it so embarrassing? And why was it so shaming that now all of a sudden, there's this desperate need to make for yourself a cover-up. And this is, this is kind of what I think. I think that, uh, you know, the, the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17, it says Peter, James, and John, Jesus went up to the mount, and then the glory of God was displayed. And it says his face shone like the sun, and his garments were, were light, and his clothes were glorious. You know what I think they lost? Here's what I think. I think their clothes were the glory of God, the light of God. When they sinned, that light went off them, and they saw their humanity as it had never been seen before. And, and our humanity compared to the glorious nature of God, not good. And so there was that need to even take a feeble step to cover yourself up. And then they do this. Then they actually, they make coverings. Now, you know what's interesting? Is they did this, and then when God expelled them out of the garden, it says this. It says, and God got an animal, skinned it, and clothed them. Isn't it interesting that God didn't leave them and let them leave in a really inadequate, vulnerable state? They still had the consequences to deal with, but that's the grace of God. So you know what? You're not going to leave here with fig leaves. Come here. You have to go. You have to go. And if you eat of that other tree, then you're going to live in an eternal sinful state. And then you got all kinds of problems. That's why Jesus had to come. And so he clothes them. And to me, that's just a glorious thing right there. That God goes out of his way. And then there's the first sacrifice there. And then the man and his wife, he heard the Lord God. He was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees in the garden. Once again, I think sin and rebellion is a small form of insanity. That you're, gonna, you're actually going to hide from the creator of creation in the creation. There's a bush. <laughs> He'll never find us here. Right. That's good thinking right there. Good thinking. But you know what he says? This, I love this right here. They hid from the Lord God among the trees in the garden. But the Lord called to the man, where are you? You know, this is the first game of hide and seek. It is. It's the first game of hide and seek. And we've been hiding from God ever since. We've been hiding from God yet longing for him at the same time. Which is why we play this go away, come closer game. It's all rated, it's connected. It's all connected right here. So look at look what this sin and this bad choice did, man. It caused you to hide. And then God says, Where are you? You know, it's not like God is going, Where are you? You know, like King Kong coming through the jungle, you know? No. He walked in the cool of the day, as he had done many times looking for what he had always been looking for, and that's fellowship with creators, with creation. And he's saying, where are you? And God knows something's wrong. So this is a father that knows he's lost some children, and he's desperately seeking them. 
Well, I'll just tell you this right now, emphatically, prophetically, any way you want to slice it. If you're hiding in shame and sin and rebellion, the God of the universe is looking for you and asking, where are you? Because he wants to pull you in and heal what you could never heal. Clothe you like you could never be clothed. He wants to clothe you with righteousness. He doesn't want to cover over your sin. He wants to out, out, cleanse, wipe it away, forget about it. That's God. Now, how many of you recognize in your life, you sin, you rebel, you hide? Let me see your hands. Okay. You know, you ever heard of the cookie monster? I'm him. It was me all along. Because I had this little problem with gluttony. I had this problem with, you know, sweets. And so my wife and I would play this little game. She would buy the cookies and hide them. I thought it was a great game. Because I always win. You're not going to hide cookies from me, man. I'll find them. So she would hide these cookies because she knows that once I get into the cookies, I always eat too many cookies. So I was going through pots and pans one day, found this new sleeve of Oreos, three of them, three sleeves. That was one of the first places I looked. She's got to up her game. I mean, the giant stew pot? It's obvious. So I get in there, I have a couple cookies and put it away, seal the little flap. A few minutes later, I think, man, those were really good. I might go back and have a couple more. But I'm going to limit myself because you don't know LaDonna. No. She, even when she's scolding me, she's sweet. Honey. I don't know. So I went back, man, and I, and I ate like half the thing. And I thought, now I'm in trouble. And this isn't my first time I've done this, so now it's like, oh, stupid, man. So I thought, I gotta, I gotta cover this up. So now you've got this big space in the front where the Oreos were, but there's no more Oreos. So my clever mind is, I moved the rows forward, <laughs> reseal. The problem is, is that when she picked them up, the back half went up in the air. She said, did you get into the cookies? I think it's pretty obvious. <laughs> Honey, I know. I know. I have a problem. I know. You ate half the bag. I said, I could have eaten the whole thing. I could have. It wouldn't have even been that hard, but... I didn't want to be a pig. <laughs> I only ate half the bag. Isn't that interesting? How silly. And I could go through story after story through my whole life, just like you can, ways that you thought you were brilliantly covering up some little sin, some little rebellion. And in the end, it was just so futile. It was so... I, back in the old days when you got report cards, the teacher did it in ink. Maybe, I don't know, have you ever seen a pen? So I got my report card. I was in fifth grade. Great grades, except for one D. It's like, oh, gosh, I, can't, I cannot bring that home, man. I can't bring that home. So I go out in the woods. Because you're going to be sneaky, you got to go out in the woods. So I went out in the woods, and I pulled out my little report card. I got this pen, and I actually thought I could turn a D into a B. An E would have been better, but a D to a B, man. And I did it and, it, and I botched it. I botched it. So I didn't go home. Wouldn't go home. I didn't go home. I'm not going home. I hid out at some neighbors. I did. What's the matter, Bob? <laughs> I, and they, they came looking for me. They called all the neighbors. Bobby over there? What are you doing over there? Oh, okay, I'll come home right now. I'll come home and show them the deal, man. I was like horrible. 
horrible. Let's stand up. You know, you know, you know what I really just want for you today? I want you to entertain the idea that wearing a mask won't work for the long haul. It, it won't. That actually there is a place in Jesus where you can really live authentically and be who you are. Warts and all. Now, if the church does its job, we will all be clothed with humility. If we did its job. Which means, in humility, I look at you, you look at me with humility, and I'm not shocked by your sin. I'm not. My gosh. I, I've been a Christian 38 years. There isn't a sin I haven't heard. Seriously. That's the truth. Is there enough grace and mercy for that? Now, once again, it doesn't mean there's not consequences. I get it. But I'm just saying, wouldn't it be amazing if you and I could live a life where we didn't have to put on any face for anybody anytime? That if somebody asked how we were really doing, how are you doing, we wouldn't have to go through that Christian thing. Great. Praise God. Awesome. Jesus, homeboy. Really? I, in fact, I learned a long time ago that I always ask people that question three times. It's sad that I even have to do that because here's what happens. How you doing? Great. How you doing? Good. How you really doing? <laughs> that's, that's happened so many times. Now, why, why don't we just skip it all? How you doing? Hell. I'm doing hell. It's eating my lunch. Sin has overtaken me. I feel like Jesus has left the building. I need help. Why can't we do that? Because it's a shame. I believe, I believe God is want, he's after this. He's after this. God, I pray that you would put an end to our hiding. I thank you that your light goes after darkness. I thank you, Lord, this book tells us who you are, what your intents are, what your character is, how you treat all people. And so I pray and I believe, this is my declaration of faith, that there are people that you've done things, you've had things done, that has been the secret of your life. And it has owned you and it has driven you and you work so hard to keep people away from that. I believe there will be anointed words that will help set people free. Not too long ago, I was with somebody I didn't really know and I felt like the Lord said, I want you to share something with them. I didn't know them and it was like, eesh. And so I wrote it down on my notes, and I just went up to him, I said, hey, uh, I got something I believe the Lord wants me to share, and it's really awkward, and it's really uncomfortable for me, but with your permission, I'd like to share it. And I said, yeah. And this is the words that came out of my mouth. Daughter, you have no defects. I've never said that in my whole life. And her head went down, and tears started coming. And I don't know what that's about. I really don't. I, I couldn't even tell you what it's about. I shared some other stuff, but it was obvious they were running for a long time and feeling so defective in God. And it was a lie. Love it. Love to expose those lies. So, Father, I, I'm contending in these weeks freedom, humility, confession, light to darkness freedom from bondage of lying and hiding trying to cover ourselves you are the gracious God either there is therefore now no condemnation condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus or there is and I know there's not so I pray God that we would live and walk in the freedom that you have and only you can bring in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus